Thank you for having me here. Uh, I am Michael Kazarian, as I had referred to, and I'm part of Promentech. We are a, uh, a company based out of the US. Uh, I work specifically out of Denver, Colorado. What I'm looking to talk to you about today is really kind of our journey as a, a software startup company and, and how our evolution to uh, really starting from nothing, we were a startup in all essence, uh, starting from nothing, how we, how, we, you know, who, how we became who we are as Promentech, how we found Axon, how we derived our technology stack, which uh, of course, as you would expect, is uh, one of the cornerstone technologies is the Axon framework. And then I think maybe what would be more interesting, depending on the audience, which I may ask for your, your input on, is the, the lessons learned. Because honestly, no, no surprise, there are a lot of lessons learned when jumping into a new technology, a new framework, a new design pattern within a technology stack. So just out of curiosity, if I can get a show of hands, how many people here are, are very interested in more of the lessons learned versus the story of, of choosing this technology? So how many would be in lessons learned are, are, is significant? Okay. That's going to be more of the emphasis. That tells me I'm going to speed talk through the beginning portion of my presentation. Um, but before I jump into it, uh, I know there's certain stereotypes that, uh, that, that all countries and all, uh, people from all uh, uh, have in, in, in their minds related to different countries. And so uh, last week, I got a call from Allard, and he said that he was going to be in Denver. He's going to be presenting at the DDD conference. And he's asked if, if, if he could stop by our office. And of course, I've been working with him, as he just said, for over two years now, and my team has been working with him. He's kind of a rock star, right, in the, uh, in the uh, CQRS world. And so, it, oh, great, by all means, please stop by. And the excitement, I think, that was on his face when he, he showed up, and there's a little fib in this, uh, the, the excitement that was in, on his face when he showed up in our parking lot with his economy rental car was, was amazing. <laughs> Now, now that said, um, you know, I, I, we were all, you know, we tried to humor him and act like we were impressed. But then when we actually all drove our respective cars to lunch, he then realized that, no, not that impressive. <laughs> not that impressive. So, uh, ironically, that was after we went to lunch. That car was parked out in front of our building. And I said, you have to take a picture in front of this because it, it was just too perfect. Um, all right, so now I'll breeze through the parts that, that are kind of, I guess, uh, less interesting to you, but I think it's my, op my, my uh, responsibility to share with you. So down in the lower left here, we have Promentech. That is the company that I work for that I'm an architect uh, with. We are part of the Promontory Mortgage Path family of companies, and we have a sister company that is in the fulfillment services, which really means that their job is leveraging technology that we produce. They help uh, banks and lending institutions expedite or, or, or I guess decrease cost in performing more, uh, mortgage origination services. It's very costly to have staff and such that is qualified, licensed uh, to perform these actions and they actually do that as a white label service to these entities. And the beauty is they also have a great partnership with us uh, leveraging our software as it develops. Our vision at Promentech we, we have some core tenets that we kind of build our, our principles upon, and it's being transparent, efficient, and understandable. And this spans both a consumer-facing view and the institutional lenders, the employees within the banks. We want to make the lending process better for all by providing better data, being more efficient in the capture and management of that data, and just making our application intuitive. We, we, we actually have some cornerstones where we feel that right now it's too complicated. The, you know, we all have seen those interfaces that are nothing but a bunch of text boxes with hundreds of fields. Uh, we were talking with Igor yes, or earlier about 300 fields and a save button. And that's historically how these systems have been, if not even greenfield, orange screen, you know, F9, et cetera, to, to tab through. Our job is, let's make it simple, let's make it friendly, let's make it something that people feel comfortable using, because a mortgage transaction is complicated, it's scary, it's the largest transaction a person will most likely be a part of in their life. Um, so these are things that we use as core values within our, our, our system. Now how did we start with defining what our system would look like? Remember, we, we were a startup. This all starts with uh, you know, two people meeting over coffee or drinks one day, well, we have to start honing in, forming a, a path towards building our product. And 
what really resonated with me was a meeting that I had, and it was before I was employ an employee of the company, but it was with who, the, the team who is now our senior executive team, so our CEO, CFO, chief strategist, uh, my boss, the CTO, and then our now business architect. And really the person who, who I focused the most on was our business architect, because she had years of experience as both a compliance and risk officer in the industry. So who better to really give me guidance on how do we solve problems in this industry than the person who's lived through these problems, who really was uh, you know, in the trenches with, with these issues for, for 20 plus, 30 years. And in talking with her, there were a few points that she really, uh, that she stated, now there were many points she stated, but a few that really stuck out to me. And one of them, she, she said, why is it that I'm limited to three statuses on a loan? And it, it is funny, we've already talked about loans a lot in prior conversations here. Mortgage is a great topic in technology, it seems like, all the time. I have tangible experience, and it's more complicated than any of the situations that are presented. But she said, why is there only three statuses I have, like a loan locked, a loan closed, a loan blah? Why can't I have many events and capture all of those events and really be able to use those events to drive workflow, to drive state in a system? She also had issues with the different compliance aspects. Why are people having to re-enter data over and over and over? And not only that, why can't I trust the work of the person that was ahead of me in the process? I have to reinvent all the work they did because I can't see why they made the decision they made. And so all of these kind of uh, pieces of information really just stuck with me. And, and when I walked away, I said, I got to figure out an architecture that is going to meet her pain points, that's going to solve her problems. And in doing so, I started researching different technologies and uh, looked up different message-based architectures, event-based architectures. And it didn't take long before I started finding CQRS popping up on the radar. And I'm like, what is this? I've never heard of this before. Event sourcing, hmm, sounds interesting. Uh, you know, watch videos by Greg Young, watch videos by Eric Evans, watch uh, read, read books on the topics. We've seen the blue book, the red book, et cetera. Uh, and, and then there was this, this nice soothing Dutch voice, you know, and the, this, the speaker who, uh, who started really uh, uh, was of interest to me because it was a Java stack, and I'm a Java engineer by, by trade. And uh, I really started digging in saying, this, is, this, is, this has some legs to it. This might be of interest. And uh, started also looking at, uh, you know, how, how is it that, uh, you know, well, let, let me take a step back. The, the eventing model that I was talking about that CQRS with ES provides, I was looking at now cross-referencing that with the pain points. Events, immutable, auditable, fantastic. That checks a box for me and my architecture. This, this uh, ability to project data in ways because our business architect said, why is it that I can't see data in different formats. And I tell her, well, I don't know what format you always want it to be in, right? We always ask for reports. I don't know if it's your experience, but when a, a set of requirements comes out, there's all these functional requirements, and oftentimes the reporting section says to be determined or something at the bottom, and there's not a lot of insight put into that. Well, I want to embrace that, and I think that that's what CQRS helps afford me with the ability to project off of events that have been push into our event store, and then I can go and actually leverage those to present data in the future. Um, but a lot of my check, my check boxes were all really met by looking at her pain points and looking at where CQRS ES offers, and then finding Axon Framework as a framework that really helped guide me down that path, getting me out of the gates a lot faster. I didn't want to have to, as Allard said, reinvent the wheel, because God only knows that I would have to basically, what you took six years of evolution on, uh, you know, it would take me about the same, and, and what's the value proposition there? My job is to make a business type, you know, product, not, not a technology framework. Uh, jumped ahead a little bit in my slides, but I think that's important to say. The, uh, some of the other interesting points that we had to worry about is, like, while trying to solve all these problems, we, I had a very unique experience. I don't know how many people here have been part of a true greenfield application development. How, how many people have been part of greenfield, start from scratch, no legacy, no nothing? A couple here. Uh, so we had that, but we also had to figure out furniture, find a building, hire resources, you name it. So it was quite distracting. There was a lot of tasks around uh, you know, solving all these problems. Uh, one lesson learned that I, I have found is in that early phase, it's amazing the things that I, I don't know if it translates, but I dug in on. 
I had a very emotional tie to that were early in the phase of this uh, of of our, our our company as a you know formation. It uh, you know things that you feel are so significant that I really need to go to battle on, and then in hindsight, six months, twelve months, a year later, you really find out that that's always not the most important thing. That actually, as time evolves, you you find that there are things that those were trivial and that the things you weren't thinking about are the things you really probably should have been focusing on. And the lesson learned there is don't have tunnel vision. Take that step back every so often, especially when you feel that you're getting emotionally driven and tied and digging in on a specific topic. Take that step back and make sure, is this really what I want to dig in on? Is this really what is going to be the differentiator for our company? It is something that uh, I had to learn through you know, trial and, and tribulation, but you know, I think that uh, hopefully I could start applying that. Uh, one of the other issues with Greenfield is that the world was our oyster. We had too many choices. And I may be able to go into this with more detail when I show a picture of our tech stack, but we, we, we went big. We saw all the magic technologies that were out there. So I now had Axon Framework in our mix. We had Spring, Spring Boot, uh, Spring Security, JPA, yada, yada, yada. That's all great. But we also saw this technology called Kafka and Samza and Mongo. And we had it all. We put all of that in our technology stack. And then we built a whole end-to-end -end, uh, communication path through that stack. Now, what I then realized was, it took us a ton of effort to support that. We, we made ourselves an infrastructure company, not a technology company that was, was uh, you know, building business functionality, which is our differentiator. And uh, what really helped level set us there was a senior uh, executive from a, a technology company in Denver that provides uh, you know, data centers. Uh, they compete with like Rackspace or nowadays Amazon, Google, et cetera. He came in and we did a quick presentation of our stack flowing through a CQRS model. We had Axon, we had an event store, we had Mongo, we had an op log being tailed that was pushing to Kafka, Kafka back down into another SAMSA job that then projected off into a Postgres denormalized set of views. And he said, congratulations, you built a Hello World app. And I'm like, oh, you just, you just I was so excited and he burst my bubble. But it, it did, you know, it helped me realize, and also discussions with Allard and Renee back in the past, that it's not the cool technology that's going to make us special. So we actually stripped down all of that technology and went back down to the core. And, and right now, I can say that our core is still, we're heavy spring, we stripped out Mongo, we're heavy Postgres, uh, and we're Axon. Axon providing both the, the event uh, command processing, the event storage, and then also the event projection. So he's been talking about the event streaming capabilities. And I could say that that has put a lot of the attention on my team on deriving business logic, which is what's going to make us a, a special company, not the fact that I was running Kafka, Samza, and whatnot. Now, mind you, it is cool to have that in my back pocket that I now can come back to those technologies should the need arise. Should there be a, uh, you know, a business problem or a, a, an ops problem, that mandates us going to that type of scalability and technology, we have that now. We, we've performed the hello world, the POC is done, we can move on. I'm gonna skip over a couple things here. Uh, I kind of divulge or, or some information about the research. There were some competitors. Why did we choose Axon over, say, like a Akka event store? And I know there's a few others that have been coming about since our decision was made. Uh, I know there's Eventuate, there's, other, there's multiple frameworks under Akka. Uh, as I said, I was a Java engineer, and it only made sense, uh, you know, when I had too many other things to worry about, and I didn't want to introduce too many new technologies with languages, et cetera, into the stack. And in looking at Axon, I found out, you know, that, that the history, the fact that at the time I was doing my research, there was already six years of development and production utilization of that framework. And I found that to be to, uh, quite important. I also looked at what's the volume of you know, messaging on the Google groups. And I'll tell you, this guy is more responsive than anybody I've ever seen in the world uh, when it comes to that group. Uh, it, it's quite impressive. And also uh, his responsiveness when I reached out personally to him to say, I want to connect with you. I want to see, I, I wasn't going to go and partner up with a technology. I'm used to partnering in the past with you know, Oracle or what was WebLogic at the time, or uh, you know, IBMs, et cetera. This was, you know, when I'm talking commercial products, 
uh, this, this was a leap of faith. I was hedging a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of risk with going with a framework that was it, it more niche at the time in my view. And so I felt that a nice way to hedge my risk was to partner up with the source, the, the actual founder of that. And I partnered up with Trifork at the time and now I have a partnership with Exonic and I have a, about five engineers in the room that are actively on my team developing that are out of the Amsterdam office here. Uh, and it's been quite valuable. So, as I just mentioned, why the Axon framework? Java-based, the maturity, the resources, and the support. This is our tech stack at the highest levels. This is my, well, I was gonna say it, I will say it in, a, in, in, a, uh, in my units, a, a 30,000 foot view, we say. So I guess that'd be a 10,000-ish meter view, if you use equivalent uh, lingo here. Uh, and then this next view is more of what I would say is our 10,000 or I guess roughly 3,000 meter view. It's, we're not down at ground level, but this is our stack. Uh, I mentioned some of these technologies already. We have, we have Spring, we have Axon Java, we have our projectors in Java, we're pers persisting to Postgres for both event store and our uh, denormalized views. Uh, we have Angular front ends uh, and then various other technologies that support our integrations with third parties and such. Uh, most of you are probably familiar, if you've ever worked in CQRS or specifically with Axon, are probably familiar with this, this concept. Um, the things I would say that are of interest to me, uh, right here, so, and I, this kind of, actually I'm going to hold off because I think it goes into my lessons learned. Uh, any questions though, first off, I guess, before I continue, real quick on this, does this look familiar to people? I'm guessing this, this is a pretty standard representation. Yes? What do you use the event bus? Our event bus is the Axon framework. Okay. So we're using its event, so with Axon 3, the event bus and the event store got smashed into one, which is why down here I have that as one box. And so we are using Axon's capability to project messages to event handlers, which are not event handlers inside the aggregates or entities, but are uh, event handlers inside of our either service agents, our different to normalize view listeners, et cetera, to then project that data down into our query stores. So you said that the one point you used Kafka, how, how did it try to get a picture? Yeah, so what we use Kafka for, so can you imagine that this event store replaced that with MongoDB? And then we had, a, a Mongo has an op log, which is their commit log. We actually had a tailed listener that was a SAMHSA listener listening to that op log, taking all of the different appends and whatnot into that store. And then we pushed that into a Kafka topic that was partitioned, say, by uh, some sort of identifier. From there, we had listeners, SAMHSA listeners on, or s subscribers, uh, of those topics that then were responsible for just writing down into our denormalized projection views. Uh, as I said, it, was, it, it, it worked great, but it added extra layers, right? Then we had Zookeeper, Yarn, we had all this stuff, and man, we were a startup and we had no clients yet. Why would, why would we need that? We did it because it sounded cool at the time, but we luckily very quickly realized it took a matter of a couple months before we formally stripped that out. Uh, here's the product, the first product that we built, and it's called our Borrower Wallet. The Borrower Wallet is an application that facilitates initial collection of consumer data. So these are the applicants who are applying for loans. Uh, it gives them a means to upload that information, the data and the documents necessary to underwrite a loan, to make a decision on do you have the ability to repay this loan. Uh, I'll show a bigger view here. This is our Angular front end. It's all backed by uh, communication from the Angular front end is all through RESTful APIs. Uh, actually, we just recently introduced some GraphQL capabilities too because we found that the REST APIs, that resource model was a bit rigid and we found that uh, it, was, it was costing us time and effort every time we assumed we knew what that resource model would look like and what the UI and what our UX team would come up with information they want to present. Well, they would have to wait for us as backend engineers to then go push a change of that resource for them to be able to query against it. Well, we found that GraphQL is really offering up a nice capability for us to build a, a shareable model that they could choose, pick and choose which data components they want returned and leverage those in the user interface. It's been quite powerful. We just introduced it into our stack. I think it was actually merged into our, our, uh, our repo Git repository last week. Uh, and it was demoed, yeah, I think two days ago. 
go live. Oh, this was a big move. This went on, this happened a few weeks, or no, sorry, I'm saying uh, about two months ago. And this is where the real lessons learned hit. Because all of a sudden, my ability to say, oh, don't worry, just blow away the event store, this is the day that stopped. This is the day where I was no longer allowed in a development environment when we were making mistakes and we were going all over the radar uh, to say, nope, I now have to be careful. I can't throw away events anymore because now we have production-based data. So let's get to these lessons learned. The, uh, I'm going to jump right into these. One of the interesting things I found that in jumping into a CQRS ES world, for all of us who've been working in a layered architecture for years, it is a mental remap. You have to now split your brain into that read side, write side way of thinking. What logic goes in the read side? What logic goes in that write side? Well, I actually find that for myself personally, and even for my senior engineers who have 10 plus years, say, in a layered architecture, they struggle more than any of my engineers who are coming fresh out of university, fresh, you know, less than five years in the stack. It just makes sense to them. But it, I do find that I have to reiterate over and over with my senior engineers because they keep wanting to put everything in one application service. They want all of their, their, their fetching of current state, mutation of state, persisting of that state, fetching of that state to happen in one service layer. And, and when working with a CQRS ES model, that is something that you will have to take that step back and actually pay attention to the detail of what type of logic, that state mutation going on that right side, and that read side being where I fetch that, that representation of state. Axon nuances, of course, with any framework you jump into, you know that there's gonna be nuances that you have to learn to, uh, to really get the most out of that framework. So we're talking command handlers. One of the lessons learned that, learned that we had, not doing data lookups within the context of, an, of a command handler. Why? Because Axon puts a lock on that aggregate. Now it's that specific instance of an aggregate. So if I have an applicant, it's that applicant that's locked for those millisecond, microsecond, depending. It could be seconds if I do it really poorly. Um, so that's where we try to do all of our front loading of hydrating the command with enough state that it doesn't have to do remote lookups. Um, event handlers. My engineers love to trace logs. And so in our early days, we had an event handler for every event that we possibly had in our system. Well, that meant that Axon had to go, and when it saw that event come in and wanted to rehydrate the aggregate, it was going to go and also deserialize the object, delegate a call to the handler. We would say, trace. We would print it, and then it would go to the next one. Well, there's a performance hit on that. We actually mitigate. If I don't need to handle that object because I'm not trying to hydrate the aggregate with state from that event, don't handle the event inside the aggregate. That event is still available to project in our projection read side model, but that was a lesson learned that we had that really helped with performance. When we talk about command bus, we initially started off, just like I said, we kept it simple. We wanted to just build the business functionality. Well, we then realized that once you go to production, it's not that we just realized, we've been through this before, I've done enterprise development for, for decades now, right? We knew that we had to be highly available. Well, Axon's asynchronous bus or simple bu command bus would not provide that capability, we took a calculated risk and said, yeah, we're going to accept that. But then now we realize that that is something that we have to uh, fully support. And so Steven in the back of the room has helped us with building a distributed command bus that will sit on top of console as its backing service location uh, capability. Parameter resolvers were really just a, a nice to have in the sense that it cleaned up our code. It gave us the ability to not have to go and find details out of events related to metadata or other parameters. Axon behind the scenes automatically hydrated instances of these objects for us, which really made our code much more readable. We could let the framework do the heavy lifting on these low level tasks of creating objects that are based off of that event, and we could just work off of those objects. That was really elegant and it took us time. And then, one interesting thing, I'll, I'll actually, so I only have a minute left, my, my nice little cue cards here. Uh, I think that lob madness. So we actually run Postgres, we had Hibernate, and the Axon framework running on that, uh, behind the scenes, Postgres would put all of the payload and metadata of our events and our uh, tokens that were, we use token tracking processors, it would put those over in a lob table, which meant that every interaction with our entities in our domain entry, uh, entry table, our event store, 
would have to do joins across to this lab table. That was extremely painful. It made it also very complicated to query that information. So we did go through the effort of uh, converting that to, to get rid of the lobs and actually store byte data, which actually very easily could be converted into the raw JSON that we store in our event store. And one anecdote here is that we did recognize an over 30% speed increase by our efficiency gain in actually delobbing our data store. So that was a great lesson learned. We proved that through replaying all of our analytics uh, uh, dimensional model off of our event store, and it, and it ran 33% faster. Um, I think that we're, we're close on time, so I don't know the, let's see if I play ahead here. We're very close to the end, so let me just say a couple things also that, that was a lesson learned. My, my mapping of my mind also took, uh, it, my view of, of, of what a projection or what a uh, listening to an event store was all about and how I get that into a denormalized view, it's the only way I thought about how an event store would be leveraged. When we talked about an event bus, these events getting streamed out. And, and fortunately, just with time, and it's pretty trivial when you think about it in hindsight, it's not just the denormalized projections that, are, that, that uh, achieve value or attain value from listening and consuming events streaming out of an event store. We actually use those, like I just mentioned, our analytics team outside of our transactional system. They are offline running an Axon server where they are only using the streaming capabilities, listening to an event store to build a denormalized representation of our model. We also use that uh, event stream to publish off messages to remote services through AMQP. So that was something that initially I didn't actually think about, but all of a sudden when you think, how do I talk cross microservice? We need to talk to third parties, we need to talk to our clients. When something happens in our system, you apply for a loan, I need to send a notification to our client into the lo their loan origination system to notify them that an applicant from our point of sale signed on with a loan. And so these, these were just different tools that as you work in a framework, you just learn. You just, they, they become common sense, but I can say that these weren't common sense to me and it took some time, it took some uh, lessons learned, and hopefully in, in talks like this, it, it just makes it that much easier for you. Uh, with that said, I am gonna wrap it up here because uh, I think some of this other stuff, uh, I could talk to you offline if anyone's interested in some more lessons learned, uh, but with respect for time, I'm gonna take a breather here. <laughs>